everyone. Good morning. In this lecture today, I'm going to talk to you about hepatitis E virus. So what are the different topics that I'm going to cover? I'm going to cover about the discovery and the history. I'm going to cover about how this virus gets transmitted, what are the methods of diagnosis, and what are the different genotypes, and what is the pathophysiology of this virus, and also going to talk about you know, if there are any vaccines available for this virus. Okay, so let me first begin. Hepatitis E virus uh, history and discovery. So an epidemic of hepatitis E virus was report reported in the year 1955 in, in Delhi, India, with about 229,000 cases of ictiric hepatitis. Okay, so this was the first time when the, the, uh, in, in, in New Delhi, in India, where 29,000 cases of this uh, ectatic hepatitis was reported, and this was actually later on found to be hepatitis E virus cases. So, uh, this is the first uh, thing. And the second thing is that several waterborne, in addition to this incident, there were several water, waterborne outbreaks uh, that were reported throughout India. And most of these cases were non A and non B, leading to the disease to be described as enteric non-A, non-B hepatitis, okay? So basically, uh, in addition to this uh, uh, outbreak in the year 1955, there were other outbreaks that were reported in India, and these uh, hepatitis cases, they were not related to hepatitis A, that's why non-A, and also uh, to B, that's non-B, and hence it was called enteric non-A, non-B hepatitis, or ENA, NBH. Right, so this is the another important point in the discovery and the history of this virus. So, third major outbreak that is really related to water-related epidemic outbreak in the Kashmir Valley of India. This also happened in India. Was reported at the end of the year 1978, where 52,000 cases were reported and 1,700 deaths were reported. Okay, so. These, are, these were some of the few uh, historical events that happened uh, in the discovery of hepatitis E virus. So, in all of these cases, in all of these outbreaks, what was the thing? They, they were, there were symptoms. The symptoms were similar to hepatitis A, but, th th and, but, but these, uh, the, these cases, these patients, they were negative for both hepatitis A and hepatitis B, and uh, hence, therefore, confirmed as E and A and VH, okay? So these patients were negative for hepatitis A and B, but the symptoms of these cases were similar to hepatitis A. That's why it was confirmed as E and A and BS, that refers to enteric non-A, non-B hepatitis. It was until the year 1990, this noble E and A and BS was uh, partially cloned and sequenced, and from this year 1990, this, this, this virus was called hepatitis E virus, okay? So it was in the year 1990 the, when and the, 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 the DNA, when this noble ENA and B was, was partially cloned and sequenced and hence the, it was called hepatitis E virus. So basically, a uh, few major events, the, the outbreaks that were reported in uh, starting from 1955 and also in the year uh, 1978, so um, several uh, outbreaks happened in India, and these these all the patients they showed symptoms that were similar to hepatitis A, but they were uh, the, the, all the patients were but the patients were negative for hepatitis A and hepatitis B, and it, in the year 1990, this um, unique virus, this virus was called hepatitis E virus. Okay, so this is the brief history and the discovery of hepatitis E virus. So now. It, let me talk about what is the virology. What is hepatitis E virus particle actually? This hepatitis E virus particle, it has an icosahedral shape. They are non-enveloped and they form virions that the, with a diameter 27 to 34 nanometer. These are single-stranded and positive sense RNA molecules. Okay, so basically these viruses are positive sense single-stranded RNA virus particles that are they 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 are icosahedral in shape shape and the sizes of this virus is 27 to 34 nanometer. Okay, so uh, this is the most one of the most important point that you should really pay attention to. So the, about their shape, icosahedral shape, 27 to 34 nanometer uh, diameter and single stranded and positive sense RNA. Okay, so. This picture here shows the genome arrangement of hepatitis E virus. I said that 
it's a positive sense RNA molecule, but how the genome arrangement of FRC virus is and the different steps involved in FRC virus replication, that is summarized in this figure here. Okay, so first look at this, this, this part here. This is the genome of hepatitis C virus. As you can see, it is a positive sense genomic RNA, right? So it has a 5 prime cap, okay, 5 prime cap and 3 prime polyatail. tail. And if you, if you look more closely, there are three open reading frames, open reading frame 1, open reading frame 2, and open reading frame 3, okay? So, like I said, SEV, so how big is this genome? So, this HEV genome is about 7.2 kilobases, okay? This HEV is, a SEV, hepatitis e, uh, SEV is about 7.2 kilobases, uh, of which 5 prime on translation region is capped with 7 methyl guanosine. So, yes, here we have 5 prime capping, that's 7 methyl guanosine, and followed by 3 open reading frames, ORF1, ORF2, and ORF3, and also, we have here poly a tail at the 3 prime end. Okay, so it's a positive sense uh, RNA molecule. Right, so this is the first point, many very important point, guys. You should really pay attention to this. And the next, it, it, it ends 3 prime on translated region. It ends with poly a tail, like I said before. That is A, it stands for adenine. Okay, so and then the viral replication starts with the translation of open reading frame 1 encoded non-structural polyprotein okay so then what happens we have this genome this is the viral genome and the replication starts with the translation of open reading frame one this the open reading frame one and and it leads it leads to the synthesis of non-structural polyprotein okay this is the first step in uh, this virus replication okay so we have this orf this gets replicated and hence we will have this non-structural uh, polyprotein okay this 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 will be translated orf1 will be translated into non-structural polyprotein this is the first uh, uh, step and the next step is then we have here an rna dependent rna polymerase then transcribes the full length negative sense rna molecule okay so we have this is the genomic rna okay guys this is the genomic rna and from this genomic rna so then uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase. This is RNA dependent RNA polymerase activity. It happens, and then we and it, this this genomic RNA is transcribed into negative sense RNA molecule. Okay, negative sense RNA we have here. Okay, this is a full length negative sense RNA molecule. This is the next step. Okay, so. After this, this negative sense RNA molecule, this serves as a template, okay? This serves as a template for the synthesis of two viral positive sense RNA, uh, RNAs in infected cells. One is full-length genomic, uh, full-length uh, genomic RNA. This is a full-length genomic RNA. For this, it acts, uh, for the, this acts as samples for the, for the synthesis of these. And another is a subgenomic RNA containing capsid encoding protein, okay? The subgenomic RNA containing capsid encoding protein here and fully functional protein encoding YRF3, okay, YRF2 and YRF3. So, uh, I will describe here, okay, so what, what happened? So, this is the genomic RNA, right? From this, in this genomic RNA, first, first thing is that first step is ORF1, it gets uh, transcribed and then translated into non-structural polyprotein. This is the first step. Second step, we have this hepatitis E genomic RNA, and from this hepatitis E genomic RNA, it is transcribed in the presence of RNA dependent RNA polymerase into a what negative sense RNA molecule from three prime to five prime. This is a full length, right? Now this full length negative sense RNA molecule it acts as a template. Thank you for the synthesis of this genomic RNA. Okay, full length genomic RNA. This is a, this is one. The next thing is that this uh, this this negative sense RNA molecule it also acts as the template for where you know this RNA different RNA polymers activity happens so template for the synthesis of subgenomic RNA which is 2.2 kilobases okay uh, subgenomic RNA that is 2.2 kilobases and so we have this subgenomic RNA with 2.2 kilobases and then translation happens right translation happens and so we get from capsid protein one is the capsid protein this is from our ORF2 from ORF2, we get capsid protein, right? And from ORF3, this is open reading frame 3, what we get? From open reading, open reading frame 3, we get polyfunctional protein, okay? This is PP. That is polyfunctional protein that is encoded by ORF3, okay? So this ORF3 and ORF2, 
uh, that for uh, for these uh, from ORF3 and ORF2, what we get from 3, we get polyfunctional protein. This is the translated product. And from ORF2, we get capsid protein. This is really important step. I hope you will you understood, understood these. So I'm just going to give you the synopsis again. Uh, the quick revision. We This hepatitis C virus is a positive sense RNA molecule. This is here. It has three open reading frame. Open reading frame 1, open reading frame 2, open reading frame 3. This acts as a, as a template for the transcription of our non-structural protein from ORF1. Okay, from ORF1, non-structural protein it gets translated. This is the first step. And the second step is that this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase activity happens. And then what we get? We get a negative sense full-length RNA molecule. And this full-length RNA molecule, it acts as a template. It acts as a template for full-length genomic RNA. And we get this full-length genomic RNA uh, from this. And in addition to these, we also get a subgenomic RNA, right? We also get a subgenomic RNA. This is a subgenomic RNA. And it, it contains a con containing the capsid protein. It contains the capsid protein and also the polyfunctional protein. Okay, this polyfunctional protein is encoded by ORF3 and capsid protein is encoded by ORF2. Okay, this is the virology. Very important. So now, I already talked about how the replication of hepatitis E virus occurs. So in this picture, I'm going to talk about how hepatitis E virus, it actually infects the human cell. Okay, so first, what happens is that hepatitis E virus replicates, infects and replicates in hepatocytes. Okay, it's majorly hepatocytes, so it's in hepatocytes. So this picture, this is the picture of a hepatocyte, as you can see here. So what happens, the virus first, it, it binds to the it binds to what? It binds to proteoglycan heparin sulfate interact. So it binds this this hepatitis E virus particle. We have here hepatitis E virus particle. It binds to this heparin sulfate, proteoglycan heparin sulfate, and then later it it also interacts with what? And a receptor. Now the candidate receptor that is called inter integrin alpha. Okay. So candidate receptor integrin alpha on the hepatocyte surface, okay? This is all happening in the hepatocyte surface, okay? So, we have this virus particle, interacts with heparin sulfate. In addition to this, it also interacts with a specific receptor. That receptor is, this is the candidate, it's a candidate receptor that has been shown, that's, that's called integrin alpha. It's not yet fully confirmed, but this is the candidate. And, and then this will mediate the entry into the uh, cells by dynam uh, dynamine, okay? Dynamine dependent manner. So basically, now from this hepatitis E virus particle interacted with heparin sulfate and also with this unspecific receptor, and then it gets internalized, okay? So it gets internalized, right? So this is the first step. And when it gets internalized and then uncoating happens, okay? The next step is that uh, on the hepatitis, uh, yes, it is internalized. Therefore, this internalized clathrin dependent process is involved. Uncoating occurs and following the uncoating, what happens is that the viral RNA is translated into non-structural protein, okay? So basically, uncoating occurs, and then we have here this viral RNA. This viral RNA from, you know, open reading frame 1, like I said before, uh, we get non-structural proteins, okay? These are non-structural proteins, okay? And so this genomic RNA also acts as a template for the synthesis of this negative sense RNA molecule. And this negative sense RNA molecule, it acts as a template for two things, subgenomic RNA, okay, this is subgenomic RNA here, subgenomic RNA, uh, this for this, and in addition to this, it also acts as a template for the capsid protein, okay. So, the, from the subgenomic RNA, so we have two things, one is from open reading frame, this subgenomic RNA it gets transcribed, you know, I mean the ORF2, open reading frame 2 gets transcribed to, to form what? This is the capsid protein and ORF3 for a polyprotein, okay? So here you need to, uh, this this part here, okay? This is a capsid protein and this is polyfunctional protein, okay? So capsid protein and polyfunctional protein, all these proteins are formed, okay, from this, this side. So this negative sense RNA molecule, it also acts as a template for the synthesis of whole uh, genomic RNA, complete genomic RNA. So then what will happen is that these, uh, okay, we have here endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so what is the function of endoplasmic reticulum here? So the function of endoplasmic reticulum is that the positive sense RNA transfer into one open running from the capsid protein and this, the capsid protein passed through the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, these 
capsid proteins. So these capsid proteins, these are the capsid proteins, they pass through the endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum, really, really important. They pass through the endoplasmic reticulum and the virus genomic RNA is, uh, okay, so they pass through the endoplasmic reticulum and they go here and they meet with this genomic RNA and then now here the assembly occurs, okay? And now we have complete virus particle. Okay, this is the complete virus particle. So, and this complete virus particle, okay, we, we have now complete virus particle. And for this complete virus particle, so how the release occurs then from this infected cells, how this virus gets released out, that is also another important concept. And uh, th the concept is that this, oh, this complete virus particle, okay, so we have here, here, it is the complete virus particle, right? So how it gets exported out? It gets exported out uh, in a, by losing its uh, lipid, you know, as a naked. So this outer part, it will lose this, this outer part and it will go, uh, it will get exported, exported out, okay? So, and it will be then secreted in the biliary canonculi, right? And we trans, trans, uh, which traffics these viral particles to the gastrointestinal tract, okay? Where they are, um, excreted okay where they are excreted so uh, the most important point is that why this uncoating occurs because of this bile because they are initially released in bile this bile actually reduces this lipid okay so that's why um, so this the, it gets released as a uh, naked virus particle and it can again now infect the healthy uh, cell okay i'll just repeat it because this is very complicated i know but i'll, I'll try to make it as simple as possible we have a hepatitis C virus particle here, right? It first interacts with hep heparin sulfate. You know, these are the receptor present on the hepatocyte. And also the specific receptor, now it has been called as integrin alpha-3. This is the candidate receptor, okay? So this happens and it gets internalized, right? So, and then uncoating occurs, okay? So this, this out of this, this everything gets removed. We have uncoating occurs, and then we get our genomic here. We have our genomic RNA. Right, so this genomic RNA then it serves it from this genomic RNA. Okay, the open reading frame one of this genomic RNA it gets transcribed into okay, the ORF1. It gets transcribed into what this is a really um, ORF1 protein. Okay, or and what is ORF1 protein that I have already discussed? So it gets transcribed. This not only these, this, uh, this, this positive sense RNA molecule it acts as a template for uh, the transcription uh, of this negative sense RNA molecule. Right, so negative sense RNA molecule. Now it, it acts as, as a template for the synthesis of subgenomic particle 2.2 kilobases, and also for the complete uh, genomic viral RNA. Okay, so then from here we have subgenomic 2.2 kilodalton subgenomic R, uh, RNA, subgenomic RNA. This subgenomic RNA then what you know it has open reading frame two and three. Open reading frame two protein is a this is the capsid protein. Open reading three protein is a polyfunctional protein. This is a non-structural protein, okay? So, and then these two proteins and these proteins, they, what they do, and from this, these, they are from this a, a, uh, ER, endoplasmic reticulum, they, they get, you know, they, they, they move, they get transported to where? To assemble with our genomic RNA. So now this virus particle is packaged like here and it gets excited in the bile and then this, this outer part, outer covering is, is removed and the virus gets excited out is a naked virus particle and it can now further infect new healthy uh, cells okay really important to 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 learn more please refer to this uh, uh, reference that i have provided here okay so now moving next i discussed about the virology of this hepatitis virus now i want to talk to about talk to you about how this hcv virus gets transmitted and there are several ways if one of the most important ways the virus gets transmitted is by waterborne transmission that is you know, the humans are the main reservoir of hepatitis E virus 1 genotype and 2 genotype and large waterborne ep epidemics are caused by accidental fecal contamination of drinking water, okay? So basically, because the virus gets excreted out from the fecus and this fecus, if it goes into the water, uh, then from there, you know, this uh, the infection or the transmission of this virus occurs, okay? From the contaminated drinking water. And the next way of transmission is zoonotic transmission. That means that if we eat, it's a direct or indirect, you know, uh, contact with uh, a direct or indirect contact with our uh, um, infected animals or consumption of contaminated food products. Okay, infected animals or con consumption of contaminated food products. 
that will actually lead to the transmission of hepatitis E virus 3 and 4 to humans. Hepatitis E3 genotype and 4 genotype are abundant in basically different swine products. Okay, if we if you eat pork and that is undercooked meat, undercooked pork meat, for example, that can actually uh, be one source of transmission of this virus. Okay. And the next is iatrogenic transmission. That means that although this method of transmission is less common than waterborne or genotic transmission, but hepatitis E virus can be transmitted iatrogenically between humans uh, through infected blood and blood products. For example, transfusion associated HCV infection has been documented for hepatitis E virus 3 in many European countries and for hepatitis E virus 1 genotype and 4 genotype in China um, and for hepatitis E virus 3 and 4 in uh, in Japan, okay, these are really important uh, things that you should know. Three-way, waterborne, genotic from undercooked, meat products, and iatrogenic, so from uh, this uh, iatrogenic like hospital induced, so where it gets transmitted when between humans through infected bloods and blood products, okay, infected blood and blood products. Right, so now I'm going to talk about the pathophysiology of this hepatitis E virus. First, first important point is that it's a non-cytopathic virus. The outcomes of acute hepatitis E infection is determined by the strength of host immune response. Okay, it's a non-cytopathic virus and its outcome is determined, the outcome of the infection is determined by the strength of host immune response. So how strongly host immune responds to this virus, that will determine the, the outcome of HCV infection acute. So then HCV pathogenesis, right, pathogenesis, it, it consists of three distinct phases. One is incubation period. Acute hepatitis E, that is with various clinical phenotypes ranging from asymptomatic disease to acute liver failure and, and a convalescent phase that is characterized by a gradual recovery. So first is incubation, right, virus gets, infects us, it incubates, there is some incubation period before symptoms appear and then acute hepatitis E, and that is where we have the symptoms and the final is the recovery phase that is called con convalescent phase, okay, con Valescent phase. And HCV infection is almost always self-limited, persistent, and chronic infection can occur in the persons who are immunocompromised, for example, in pregnant women. Okay, so basically, but when we you have HCV infection, it can be it can always be most in most cases it is self-limited. Okay, you will not have severe problems, but it's especially in case of the people who are immunocompromised, like pregnant women, this can be fertile. Okay, so now hepatitis E virus, it multiplies in the river. Yes, it it's a hepatitis E virus and reaches the digestive tract via bile. This one I have already explained. And viral replication in the liver is detectable seven days after virus transmission. Okay, so seven days after virus transmission, then we can detect virus re repli replication. Okay, and the last point is that hepatitis E virus is a hepatotrophic virus, but this its replication can also occur not only in the hepatocyte balls, but also in other tissues. For example, not only in the liver, the gastrointestinal tract, kidney, central nervous system, placenta, etc. Okay. So now moving ahead, this picture here summarizes the global HCV genotype distribution. Genotype one, two, three, four. These are actually have been found to cause the crop disease or infections in human as you can see here like hepatitis e is more common in this part of the world in, in nepal and also in, 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 in i mean the countries neighboring india and you see here these two hepatitis e this is like china and india where we have hepatitis e and hepatitis uh, v for both these both genotypes okay whereas if you look here especially in the amazon region here you see this uh, hepatitis 3 Right, every ever this E virus genotype three, we have more common. So basically, the the the, the idea of this picture is that the, the virus is almost uh, we have different genotypes allocated to different locations. Uh, but I mean, this virus is present almost everywhere in in the world. Okay, so main four genotypes that cause disease are ever E one, two, three, and four. Okay, so now. So epidemiology, despite several NCB genotypes, there is only one serotype that has been reported, which simplifies seroprevalence, seroprevalence studies, diagnosis, and vaccination. So important, there are several NCB genotypes, but only one uh, serotype, okay, that has been reported. 
So hepatitis E a virus, genotype 1 and 2, are actually human pathogens that are mostly transmitted via the fecal oral route in poor countries, mainly through contaminated drinking water. This one I have already explained. And infection with HCV3 and 4, they are from, you know, if you eat undercooked meat, you know, contaminated and then, or it can also be transmitted parental via blood transfusion. So this is another important point that you should know. Hepatitis E and 3, they are genotically transmitted, like I said before, from pigs, wild boar, deer, rabbits in developed countries. Okay, these, these 3 and 4 are in developed countries, 1 and 2 in de developing nations or poor economies. Okay, so then Hepatitis E, virus 1 and 2 genotypes are estimated to infect about 20 million people in a poor countries. Okay, 20 million people. It's really important and resulting in 3.3 million symptomatic cases from this 20 million we have 3.3 million symptomatic cases and 44,000 deaths per year okay 44,000 deaths per year that's a big number 44,000 deaths per year okay so you should remember this so so I talked about this this, this how the, the different genotypes are allocated in different places of the world now here I want to talk to you about uh, the diagnosis how this virus can be diagnosed so Mean most of the infections they we, we they don't show any symptoms they are asymptomatic but in in individual presenting with hepatitis symptoms are it's, it's hard to distinguish the symptoms from those of hepatitis A okay so because they are very similar to hepatitis A virus symptoms so then how the diagnosis is done diagnosis is done either indirectly by detecting anti HCV antibodies in the serum or directly by det detecting HCV RNA or capsid antigen in the blood or other body fluids okay. Really important. Direct, we detect antibody for anti-HCV antibody, and indirectly we, we can we can detect HCV RNA or capsid antigen in the blood or other body fluids. Hepatitis E virus RNA becomes ridiculous in the blood and stool during the incubation periods and persists for four weeks. Okay, we can detect this active infection and six weeks in bloods and feces res respectively. So four weeks and six weeks. So in blood for four weeks, and we can detect it in the feces for six weeks respectively SEV RNA. Capsid antigens a presence in the blood evidently for the same duration. So basically capsid antigen also the same duration. Okay, in the blood. So that means four weeks approximately. And the next thing, what are the different tests? This one I have already explained. So we detect the detection of SEV specific antibodies, including anti SEV IgM and IgC antibodies. We can also Amplify the viral genome using conventional PCR method or real-time reverse transcription PCR. If we want to identify the specific genotype, then we can do sequencing, okay, to identify the specific uh, genotype of hepatitis E virus. So, finally, the clinical aspects of this disease. The main side of replication for hepatitis E virus is the liver, but they, the replication can also occur in other places, for example, in the brain, kidney, placenta, etc., and Neurological manifestations, you know, that they include, you know, gurlian Barrett syndrome and neurologic amyotrophy, while kidney disorders such as uh, cryo, um, cryobulinemia and hematological condition, etc. Okay, these, these are some few uh, numbers. That means we have neurological manifestations, we have kidney disorders, you know. When the pregnant women, women, they are infected with hepatitis E virus 1, then the study suggests that the death is even more than 30%, okay, within the third trimester, mainly due to fulminant hepatic failure. So it's very, it becomes very dangerous. If the pregnant women are infected with the HCV, then more than 30% cases, you know, the, the patients will die if, if they are in the third trimester of their pregnancy, okay, due to fulminant hepat hepatic failure. And so finally, patients... Patients with chronic hepatitis E will often rapidly progress to liver cirrhosis and have increased mortality rates. So I hope guys this video was helpful in understanding the brief virology of hepatitis E virus. Thank you very much for your attention.